Hello, everyone, and welcome to Making the Land Pay, the third in the Buell's Conversations on Architecture and Land in the Americas with Tim Mitchell and Stephanie Barral. Uh, uh, my name is Lucia Alais. I'm the director of the Temple Hoyne Buell Center for the Study of American Architecture at Columbia. I'm joining you from a campus on an island that lies within the ancestral homelands of the Lenni Lenape people. Until about 1650, the Lenape people managed the forests, the marshes, the animals, the winds, the floods, and the paths of this place by stopping in as they navigated what is now called Hudson River, seasonally staying in small encampments, growing food, perhaps also harvesting crops, hunting and fishing some animal species while conserving others, periodically setting fires to control growth, and generally maintaining a resource ecology that stretched all along the Atlantic coast from what is now Western Connecticut to Delaware and including most of New Jersey and Southern New York. By the end of the 17th century, the Leni Lenape had largely been driven out of their homelands. In the centuries since, their communities have been decimated, their humanity denied, and their descendants dispersed. The European settler state that was responsible for this erasure and diaspora relied overwhelmingly on the institutionalization of land. Columbia University, a land-based institution, is a legacy of this urge to settle and to appropriate. In fact, the red brick building in which I sit today, which you see here on the slide, embodies architecture's imbrogation with settled land in a particularly vivid way. Buell Hall is the oldest building on campus, so old it preceded the university's arrival on the site, having been built in 1885, for an earlier institution, the Bloomington Asylum, that had existed on the sites since 1821. And yet, so central was architecture to maintaining institutional legitimacy on this site, that not only did Columbia decide to keep this building when it purchased the land in 1892, but the building was preserved and moved 42 feet vertically and 97 feet north as the campus expanded and the trustees negotiated with the city deciding where the grid and the campus should intersect. Not all architectural legacies of displacement are honorific. At the same time as this campus was being built in 1897, the General Allotment Act was signed by the United States government in order to break up the large reservations of land into which indigenous communities have been gathered since the 1830s. The Allotment Act shrank the land base of surviving indigenous communities and compelled them to adopt Western institutions, such as that of private property and of family farming. So in 1995, the descendants of the Lenape officially changed or chose the name of Delaware Nation, and their communities today reside largely in Oklahoma and in Texas. And I'm showing you here the Azaja County of Oklahoma, about well, which we'll hear more today. So I recount this history today, not only to acknowledge the role of our hosting institutions in this history of displacement, but also because the relation of architecture and land is a theme of our series and takes the form of an open question. How to tell non-objectivizing histories of land? How do we heed the insight from indigenous scholars and activists that land isn't an object, but a relationship? The title of our conversation today is Making the Land Pay, and I'll just explain that briefly. As many of you will have recognized the phrase is given to us by the American architect Cass Gilbert, who made the statement, a skyscraper is merely the machine, the building is merely the machine that makes the land pay, in a 1900 article about the pressures on architects to build ever faster. This was in Lower Manhattan. This is the same time period as the Allotment Act, and also the, when the first Greek class is being taught in this building at Columbia. Gilbert was proposing an economic rule of thumb derived from his own experience with the Broadway's Chambers building, which I'm showing you here, which he had just completed, and he proudly said, from foundation to roof in less than four months. So if you read this text, on the one hand, Gilbert paints a very simplistic picture of building as an economic activity. He basically compares the value of the empty plot with the value of the same plot uh, with a building on it, and implies that each floor literally multiplies the value of the plot of land in the vertical dimension. But reading between the lines of this text, you can find a much more complicated depiction of building as a dynamic feat of technical and uh, technical organization and synchronization. The architect has to coordinate 
the ordering and the arrival of materials from various locations. The architect has to factor the income lost during the time of construction. Uh, the architect has to deal with land appreciation, with visual factors, factors of proximity. And there are also pressures that Gilbert doesn't mention in the text, but that we know from historians were very much in play, such as the pressures of labor unionization or the pressures of the rise of the developer as a kind of uh, profession. And if you want to know more about that, I recommend the dissertation by Alexander Wood, who just um, com completed his dissertation in this department. So it's not that the architect takes one object land and transforms it mechanically into another, which is architecture. The architect starts from land and then establishes a network of relationships. So Gilbert's statement has stuck, but it's in deep need of techno-political update. And our two speakers today can help us do just that. So I'm showing you two diagrams drawn from the research that they'll be presenting. They look very abstract, but in fact are very concrete financial instruments for ways that land pays today. Um, they don't look like buildings, but in fact, they contain very specific mechanisms that demand that buildings should proceed in a certain way. The buildings that we'll be hearing about today are not skyscrapers, although somewhere in the story, every time you hear that there's an economist involved, there is an office building somewhere that the economist sits in. Most of the architecture that we're concerned with today, however, is not office buildings, but the architecture of life. And by this, I mean, on the one hand, the livelihood of persons who need housing and who sometimes build it themselves. And on the other hand, entire ecological systems that support the life of a creature like this one, a little beetle, who don't live in architecture, but who have, uh, or not architecture in the traditional sense, uh, but who um, make a claim to very specific spatial footprints on earth that have consequences on building. And especially how and whether building is visibly evaluated in a global energetic and economic picture. So our event today takes the form of two presentations followed by a Q&A, and I'll just introduce um, each speaker um, just before they speak. So we'll start with Tim Mitchell, who has asked me to keep his bio short. Uh, and this is very difficult to do. Timothy Mitchell is the William B. Ransford Professor of Middle Eastern Studies at Columbia University. He is a friend of the Buell Center, having long sat on its board. Um, I'll just say that Tim writes about colonialism, political economy, politics of energy and the making of expert knowledge. Um, like um, he's currently working on a study of durability, examining how the more durable apparatuses for capturing wealth that were characteristics of the 19th century colonialism, such as railways, canals, apartment buildings, dams, how they engineered a new method for extracting income from the future, a future that we now inhabit precariously. So please um, help me and join, uh, join me in welcoming uh, Timothy Mitchell. Thanks. Thanks very much, Lucia. Uh, it's wonderful to be back at the, the Buell Center. Thanks to Jason and Jordan. Um, and I'm looking forward to the discussion with Stephanie. Um, thank you also, Lucia, for sharing the Cass Gilbert article with me. I'd heard the phrase, but uh, 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 built the, the, the building is merely the machine that makes the land pay. But I hadn't ever read the original source. Um, It, of course, um, poses a question which I think both our presentations are going to be um, thinking about. How does land have value? And what is the relationship between land having value and the proliferation of mechanisms, restraints, devices that appear to make it pay? And you've asked us to think in particular about how that is different today from the world that Gilbert was writing about just over a century ago. Um, so I think one thing I'm, I'm hoping to show and I hope will intersect with Stephanie's presentation is how these machines of uh, payment and evaluation have pro proliferated and taken much more diverse forms since the first skyscraper. But I also want to suggest in a way that the machine is the wrong metaphor. It's a 19th century picture of how value is extracted. Um, it's an industrial metaphor, one based on 19th century capitalism and very 19th century understandings of, of what wealth is and where it comes from and how it's created. Um, but actually one that even today, a century afterwards, we still like to use. Um, but I, I think it's actually interesting the way the, the very processes Gilbert was involved in um, in constructing that Broadway Chambers building um, 
we're already making it an out-of-date metaphor. And that's something I want to sort of come back to at the end. Um, I'm rather embarrassed that Lucina suggested I circulate for this, um, a paper that I wrote 15 years ago or more. Um, uh, but it, I, I think it's actually been very interesting for me to go back to that and to rethink it in relation to today's debate. Um, this was a paper called The Work of Economics, How a Discipline Makes Its World. Um, and it was about the work of um, a Peruvian development entrepreneur, Hernando de Soto. Um, in the year 2000, exactly a century after um, Cass Gilbert's article, he had published, de Soto had published a book called The Mystery of Capital um, to wide acclaim. Tom Friedman, uh, the New York Times columnist, called it the book one that had answered um, for him, the question of why capitalism works in the West and fails everywhere else. And many other leading um, pundits, politicians, and economists celebrated this work. Um, and essentially, the argument of the book was that the problem with poverty in the global South was that the world outside the West, outside the developed capital West, had not figured out how to make the land pay. Um, they did not have the right machinery for extracting payments from land, um, and that precisely those, those machines were the secret of the West. And this was the case whether one was talking about um, urban property or um, rural uh, farmland. Um, in both cases, a predominant form of, of either building or of um, uh, relating to agricultural land was, uh, was to control it and organize it and share it informally. Um, they did so typically without property titles. Um, the problem for De Soto with informal housing or informal land tenure was that the, um, the inhabitants of those houses or the farmers of that land were unable to borrow against the wealth that was locked up in their land and in their houses. And so what they needed, the, the device he, he proposed, was a simple mechanism that would unlock that stored but inaccessible wealth. Um, and it was a very simple device. And part of the enormous popularity of his work was the simplicity of the device he proposed. Um, simply go through the cities of the global south, neighborhood by neighborhood, informal neighborhood by informal neighborhood. and um, very rapidly give people property titles, register that title um, in a simple system of, of land registry, um, bypass the whole accumulated system of property titling that might already exist for the formal um, areas of, of cities and the same with rural areas um, and have this simple way of handing out uh, street by street, neighborhood by neighborhood, the title to the land. Um, And that would then allow those people to um, unlock that stored wealth that they were denied access to in the particular form of borrowing against it. Um, they would be able to take out small loans um, on the basis using this, this title as security and um, use those small loans to set up micro enterprises, to improve their farming practices and um, embark on the path of capitalist entrepreneurship that um, was the secret of the, the, the growth and wealth of the West. Um, it's still astonishing when I summarize the argument of the book that such, a, such an utterly absurd argument could have been taken so seriously. Um, uh, anyone who is familiar in any way with almost any part of the countries of the global South know how, how long and how arduous has been the struggle against such systems of credit. Um, in many parts of the world, the decisive um, political economic experience of the colonial era was the imposition of new mechanisms of credit, of debt, and of uh, courts and legal systems that allowed that credit to expand by giving powers of um, appropriation to the creditors. That, of course, led both to speculative increases in the value of land and the 
uh, rural land, but also and perhaps more so in urban land. Um, it increased the costs of housing. It made eviction widespread. It made poverty uh, endemic. Um, and if one wants to understand um, many parts, as I say, and particularly the parts that I'm familiar with in, in the Middle East, um, uh, what was happening in that, you know, particularly late 19th, early 20th century colonial period, it was precisely a struggle against everything that De Soto um, was, was proposing. And it was actually, in some ways, a relatively successful struggle. So just to give an example, in the case of Egypt, the British were forced, uh, having occupied the country in 1880, and put in place this entire mechanism, or consolidated an existing, but still relatively new mechanism of, 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 of credit and, and peasant indebtedness and loss of land. They were actually forced to limit that by passing a law that no farming household on the agricultural side um, could be dispossessed by a creditor of their last five acres. So severe was the crisis of dispossession that was unfolding under a form of colonial capitalism that had built itself on precisely um, the mechanisms of property titling, credit, indebtedness, and eviction that De Soto um, was now proposing and that um, many leading economists were uh, celebrating as, as a brilliant um, intellectual uh, breakthrough. Um, there, there are sort of two questions that that gave rise to and that I explored in the paper. Um, uh, what evidence, what evidence of any sort was there for the viability of the success or the success of this property titling program that De Soto was um, was proposing. Um, he, as, as these programs were introduced in um, various countries around the world, including in Egypt, where I first encountered uh, it in the late 1990s, um, all the reference was back to an original pilot program that De Soto himself um, had carried out um, in Peru, where um, he was originally from, not where he'd grown up, but he'd moved back there. Um, and uh, in, uh, introduced these, the, these, these programs there on a sort of pilot basis. Um, and when one looked for evidence of the success, um, it was almost impossible to find any. Um, and again and again, where there were claims that it was successful, um, the references all actually went back through to one source, which was a Princeton University PhD dissertation in economics that had gone and studied the effects of um, the property titling program as it was introduced differentially across different cities of Peru. Um, and that claimed to find that it had worked. If one actually then read the dissertation more closely, one found actually it hadn't worked. There had been no increase in um, in lending to the poor, um, despite the property titles, um, the the dissertation and those who then cited it and were excited about it were amazed, however, by a different discovery that it, even though it didn't seem to allow the poor to borrow more, it did um, because of issues in the banking industry and access for the credit uh, to credit by the poor that are much more widespread. Um, it did seem to have made them work much harder. Um, there was a 20% to 40% increase, it seemed, in the number of hours worked once people had this piece of paper. And it was hypothesized in this dissertation that that was because even if they didn't have more access to credit and therefore the possibility of more wealth um, through borrowing, they would at least um, uh, somehow, thanks to the piece of paper, feel secure enough um, to go out and get jobs. Um, maybe they spent too much time at home beforehand because of the insecurity of their titles to the property and they felt they had to be there to guard it, but perhaps with this piece of paper they were now able to go out and get jobs and that would be the explanation for um, the increase in hours worked by those with property title rather than those without. Now, um, that seemed even more absurd to anyone who knew anything about populations living in informal neighborhoods than the original claims of De Soto. Um, sort of some image, some uh, property rights theorist 
image of a world that is entirely anarchic and people are defending desperately with their own guns and lives, whatever they've got, until property titles come along. And then suddenly you have peace and order and people can go out to work. Um, it didn't stop the economists celebrating it. Um, the, the, the author was um, interviewed for jobs and there were even economists who blogged about how brilliant the job candidates were that year because they were doing such innovative work citing this PhD thesis and the author um, themselves was given a job in the Department of Economics at Harvard. Um, so that was the curious sort of origins of the, the evidence. Um, and then once there was that sort of apparent evidence, then it could be taken up by the World Bank and um, uh, promoted as a, as a solution to these issues. But um, the, the second question, um, if, if, the, if the evidence was so flimsy um, and, and so easily um, questioned, why then the success of this notion of a new set of machineries for ending the poverty of the global south? Um, why the Harvard job? Why does the World Bank then immediately start taking up these schemes as um, I, I think the most um, popular new program for addressing questions of poverty through, through the first 10, 15 years of the new millennium? Um, and what, and, and then of course the, the endorsements from the not just the, the, the pundits like Friedman, but uh, Thomas Friedman, but um, uh, from his cousin Milton Friedman and um, uh, many other um, uh, leading economists. Um, he's not his cousin. Um, the um, and 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 constant talk every year that, that the author, um, De Soto, was going to be the next candidate for the Nobel Prize in economics and so on. Um, the, the article sets out to answer that question in, in, in a way that isn't quite so relevant to our discussion today to do with um, the very sort of um, concrete organization of the neoliberal movement on the ground through um, think tanks, um, book prizes, um, endorsements by famous economists, um, the longer history of the, the original organization, the Mont Pelerin Society that had sort of carried the flame of neoliberalism from the 1930s till its emergence in the mainstream in the 1970s and 80s. Um, I mean, I think that is interesting to think about, about the sort of work that go, this is what I refer to in the article as the work of economics. I mean, not only the work that these informal property owners are now seem to be doing, um, but the work that is done in and by and in connection with discipline of economics to make these mechanisms um, uh, operate. Um, uh, and of course, De Soto's work seems to confirm everything that neoliberal economics theorists from Douglas North to Milton Friedman to many others have been saying about the absolute essential nature of, of property rights to building a system of successful capitalism and not just central, but in, in many ways, almost all you need is the basis of that and everything will follow from the securing of those rights to property. Um, but I, I thought instead, I'd, in the five minutes I've got less, uh, left, I'd talk about a different aspect of um, the success because this is one that um, I don't think I take up really in the paper and um, relates a little bit more to what Lucia mentioned about my interest in, um, in this history of durability. Um, uh, and that for me is a shorthand for a wider way of thinking about the nature of capitalist, capital and the nature of capitalism in which um, I think questions of property and building and architecture are in some ways right at the center. And it's a place where one's not thinking critically just of something like the neoliberal movement, but actually uh, about a much wider misunderstanding of capital on the left as much as on the right. Um, because on both sides, one has this understanding of capital as, um, as something pecuniary, um, as, uh, as wealth in some sense that um, 
is, is accumulated in various ways. And of course, different approaches left and right have different um, understandings of how that surplus is accumulated. But having been accumulated is then stored up and there to be reinvested. So it is something that comes from the past. Um, as Jonathan Levy has written in an interesting article, it's an understanding of capitalism as something backward looking. Um, capitalism uh, as this store, capital itself as this store that is there waiting in De Soto's case to be unleashed or in other senses simply to be mobilized and reinvested. And of course, historically, land is the form in which capital is thought to exist. Um, nowadays, land would just be one of the forms. Um, against that, an alternative view is to think of not backward looking, it's the storing up of something from the past, but there's something forward looking. Um, and specifically capital um, as the command of a future stream of revenue. Um, and command is important here. Uh, it's trying to get away from that pecuniary sense. Um, of course, that revenue can be and likely is in part pecuniary is some set of payments, rents um, for property um, or any other kind of rents in the wider sense, dividends um, that are paid to the owners of shares in a corporation, speculative gains of one sort or another. Um, these future um, flows of income, uh, their essence is not in their pecuniary nature, but in their political nature. Um, the, the, the political economists Nitzan and Bichler have been particularly important in thinking this through, this political nature of this claim on the future. Though I differ from their work in insisting on their techno-political nature. Um, and to, in other words, to think about the nature of the kinds of apparatus that can be built to secure a future revenue stream. Um, if I had more time, I'd break it up into the, the way it actually consists of both the stream from the future and the devices in the present that allow you to trade that future claim. Um, so it can be realized in the present, the stock market, a housing market or whatever. Um, and also for breaking it up into tradable units. So companies are things that are now thought of as having shares and organized by shareholding. Um, buildings are now composed of um, apartment units that can be traded separately. Um, Multi-generational housing gives way to single family housing so that it um, becomes a more tradable unit in some sense, and so on. Um, uh, once one understands capital in this different way, not as accumulation from the past, um, uh, but as um, this system of ways of indebting the future, organizing politically claims on future payments, whether those claims are payments of rent for a building or uh, dividends on stock or whatever sort. So it's a politically constructed process. Um, and it's the power and durability of those claims into the future. So durability is both a political process, but also a material um, process of the kind of constructed nature. So one of the problems of informal housing is not just its lack of title, but its lack of durability from the point of view who those, of those who want to make it an investment asset, because it's a form of housing that is easily added to, extended, pulled down, uh, rebuilt, and so on. Um, so just to wrap up, I actually want to go back, as I promised I would, to, to, to Gilbert, um, and that moment of the sort of birth of the skyscraper in the late 19th century. Um, we've been guided very much in thinking about that moment of sort of the speculative explosion of, um, uh, of, of, of the urban landscape in the late 19th century by the work of people like David Harvey. Um, uh, who of course gave us this notion of the urbanization of capital that as against a sort of earlier 19th century industrial understanding of capital in the late 19th century in Paris, but equally in Cairo and equally in New York, it becomes urbanized. Um, uh, I think, and I've argued this and it's been taken up by Brett Christophers and others, we need to switch and think about the capitalization of the urban. That is to say how and in what ways did the urban become the site of um, 
these modes of capitalization in the technical sense, these modes of organizing future revenue streams that can be given a value in the present and traded. So from that point of view, thinking in, term, in Harvey's terms, the city is not a spatial fix. It's not a frontier that somehow unblocks capital from the past, or as De Soto would think about it, that has been stored up and is blocked and needs release through some kind of spatial extension as the accumulation of capital accelerates, as it expands too fast and uh, causes crisis of one sort or another. In some ways, the city and the skyscraper is a kind of slowing down because what it accomplishes is a kind of temporal dragging out a building out of a more extended future to be capitalized over longer stretches of time, composed of more individual units. And as a result, it does absolutely nothing to solve the problem that Harvey identifies of soaking up excess capital, because what it's doing is it's drawing more income from the future, all those future rental payments that are capitalized and um, sold in the speculative building of architecture. It builds out a longer and more dense future. And of course, the amazing thing about reading Gilbert's um, four month timetable is, um, is the astonishing speed of, of a, what is it, 16, 18 story steel frame structure that goes up. In, interesting too, sorry to go back to Gilbert, but I find it fascinating. Um, because as Lucia mentioned, and I look forward to reading this dissertation she mentioned, um, you know, inside that steel frame, it's still a wood and clay structure. It's not yet a concrete structure. They haven't figured out how to pour concrete slabs. Um, and, um, and so the, the wood is floor, the, the, sorry, the floor is wooden, and, um, but there's a fireproofing layer in between a clay tile arch. So, the amount of labor to build those vaulted um, ceilings on each floor. But of course, that's required, not structurally, to, but to prevent the, the, the spread of fire. And the spread of fire, of course, is a major aspect of the architecture of, of, of skyscrapers and solving that partly through steel, but also through clay tile arches and later um, concrete is critical, not to the speed, but rather to the durability, to finally coming up with a way of building cities so they don't burn down every few years. As some of the historians of Chicago have written about very imaginatively. Um, uh, and if you can think of both the, the amount of labor that goes into constructing every ceiling as a clay tile arch, um, a, a terracotta arch, um, so one's building with clay, one's not building with sand and aggregate, um, uh, and one also hasn't yet was just at the moment of the takeoff of electrical power, which is going to burn coal, which is going to produce cinders. So you can then produce cinder concrete and gradually figure out how to replace wooden floors with concrete floors. All of that has to do with this extension of time. So I think there's something entirely different going on in Kil Gilbert's article um, uh, that, that's about slowing down and spreading out and building out futures of uh, accumulation. Um, yes, it's got nothing to say about labor, and I think that's a really important point, but in the question of who's paying, it's clearly not the land that is paying. And the, so even the very title of the article is, is misleading. And I'll stop with this sentence. Um, this is not an apparatus for making the land pay. It's for making the rents pay. And the rent is of course that future. And when one tries to think of the sort of exploitative aspects um, uh, or the those who will, whose incomes will pay for this new form of architecture and accumulation, one wants to think about the workers, but one also wants to think how a particular mode of inhabiting architecture, um, that of the payer of rent, is to come into being. And I think the the attempt to transform Peruvian neighborhoods into systems of rent payment is a useful reminder of the ways in which people are still fighting against um, these forms of apparatus, not for making the land pay, but for making um, the occupier of housing pay. Thank you. Thank you so much for this. Absolutely, first of all, uh, self-enclosed, uh, reflection on your own work, but also for engaging with um, 
with Gilbert as precisely not knowing what he's doing, but in a different way than we think we know he's not doing, um, especially uh, issues of fire and, and on how one could trade on that future uh, stability. So um, I will say no more, uh, just to thank you for your intervention. I will now introduce um, Stephanie Barral and we encourage everybody to hold your questions um, until um, the conversation between them. So Stephanie Barral is actually, uh, sort of, a, you know, has been at Columbia, uh, spent some time at Columbia a few years back, um, and but is joining us from Paris. So Stéphanie is a social scientist at the Institut National de Recherche Agronomique et Environnement, so the French National Institute for Agriculture, Food and Environment. Um, and she has expertise in uh, economic and political sociology. Her work focuses on the rise of private investments within environmental and ag agricultural policies. So essentially the question, her, uh, how are markets proposed as solutions to environmental problems? Um, and of course there's quotation marks around the word solution and problems. Her first book was called Capitalisme Agraire, Agrarian Capitalisms that came out in 2015. And that analyzes how the growth of capitalist palm oil plantations in Southeast Asia, despite social and environmental criticism occurred. So um, she today is going to talk to us about cases of bio biodiversity and carbon markets. Uh, my understanding is that um, your work does this both in France and in the US, and but we've asked for, uh, given the, our, the Americas theme, for her to uh, focus on the US. So please join me in welcoming uh, Stephanie Barat. Thank you very much, Lucia. Um, let me share my screen first. <clears throat> uh, there I should work now even though that's not the yeah can it you see great. it yes we can okay perfect thank you very much thank you very much T. i'm very happy to be here even though yes as you said i'm uh, sitting in my office in paris right now um today i will talk about the use of economic and legal mechanisms to make natural areas economically valuable in order to ensure their conservation so I, what I will do is I will highlight some mechanisms stemming from environmental policies in the USA that aim at increasing the economic value of non-productive land so as to ensure its conservation. First, very rapidly, I thought I'd give, say a few words on the historical background of these environmental policies. Because until the 1970s, there was a great divide between available land for construction and development and land that ought to be preserved on the grounds of their beauty, and especially in the USA, in the sake of wilderness. So national parks and natural reserves were the main institutional mechanisms for land preservation, the majority of which have been established in the early 20th century. And conversely, most part of territories was considered as a pool of land at disposal for economic development, urban spread, farming activities, and so on. Um, things started changing in the early 1970s. During this intense, these years of intense environmental activism, the idea that negative impacts of land development ought to be regulated emerged. The dual conception of pristine land and land for development did not hold anymore. Available land couldn't be considered only as a potential for development anymore, but also as achieving important functions, such as water regulation, but also as the habitat for a number of species that would face soon or later extinction if land was not regulated, if land consumption kept on being unregulated. So the rise of scientific warnings led to the production of a number of acts. The two main acts are the Clean Water Act 1972 that establishes protection for wetlands and the Endangered Species Act 1973 that establishes protection for species on the edge of extinction. Today, the ESA, the Endangered Species Act, lists more than 1,200 species and institute a number of mechanisms to regulate land development activities on endangered species habitats and to secure land for species conservation. So the rest of my talk will be centered on the implementation of the Endangered Species Act and notably through a specific market-based mechanism that is called conservation banking. 
During the first decade of the ESA, this market-based mechanism didn't exist. The ESA compelled a strict approach to endangered species protections. So it succeeded in imposing a ban on every land development activities that on land that was bearing endangered species habitat. So as you, as you can imagine, this was uh, very contentious at that time. And it got smoother in the 90s, in the 80s and 90s. Um, the, the, the ESA has been smoothened and uh, the, uh, since, since then ensured the possibility to impact endangered species habitat under specific conditions. The counterpart is to mitigate the impact on endangered species habitat through ecological restoration activities of the same species habitat in the surroundings of the impact, impacted land. So in other words, Flexibility was brought into the policy because it became possible to destroy land somewhere under the condition that similar nature would be restored nearby. This paved the way for the development of a market-based mechanism called conservation banking. So as you can see here on the map, there's approximately 180 conservation banks in the USA, two thirds of which being located in California and the rest of them being spread across 18 other states, including Texas and Florida. Many other states never have had uh, any conservation banks, or at least not at the moment. So what is really a conservation bank? Not to be compounded, confused with a financial bank, a conservation bank is materially a piece of land on which entrepreneurs and financiers carry out ecological restoration activities, so like they rebuild the nature, uh, of, a, of a typical of a specific species habitat. Here you see on the right side, uh, a beetle bank and on the other side, a salmon bank. So let me explain a little bit more about these conservation banks. Here's a general outline of a typical conservation bank. The square in the middle, the green square that you can see is a plot of land, the one that you just saw on the picture. It's bought by entrepreneurs that are willing to invest into species conservation. Once they have achieved ecological restoration on this little piece of land, the US Fish and Wildlife Service approve the conservation bank, which means that they permit the bankers to sell some assigned number of credit species. To whom are they gonna sell the species credit? They will sell it to land developers. So land developers, as you can also see on the graph, um, when, they, when they foresee a project that will have impact on endangered species habitat, one of the conditions they have to, to meet to be able to get authorization for their development project is to buy a number of species credits. So once they have bought species credits to the entrepreneur, then they will get the authorization and see administrative authorization of their project and be able to go on with construction. Usually the main metric that is being used is a credit per restored acre. So this makes possible for someone to make money by protecting a natural area. Prices range between $1,000 per acre up to $1 million per acre. And as you can see, a market is being forged out entirely out of regulation. But as development usually impacts endangered species habitat in perpetuity, the Endangered Species Act states that conservation ought to be carried out in perpetuity as well. Hence, this little piece of land with endangered species habitat is only the visible, the tangible part of conservation. It is also tied to impacted land and developers' duties through a complex assemblage of financial and legal tools that makes up the credits and ensure a link between impacted land and restoration in the long run. So let me present two of these tools to make myself clearer. The first one is a conservation easement. I believe most of you must know about it. It's a voluntary contract that limits certain economic activities on the land. It states landowners' obligations in terms of, 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 of conservation and its duration in time can be unlimited. Once a conservation easement is set on a piece of land in perpetuity, it becomes protected in the long run. So that's a first specification of conservation banks. They have to have a perpetual easement and to ensure conservation in perpetuity, as they say. The second tool is complementary to the easement. It's a financial endowment. So why is that? 
because conservation banks need to be maintained in the long run, as I said. So practically, fences need to be repaired, scientific monitoring needs to be carried out, etc. And last but not least, land has to remain suitable for the species in the long run. So while nature, by nature, I would say, grows and evolves to a succession of different ecosystems, conservation banks have to remain in the same constant ecological state so as to ensure the presence of the dedicated species. So the financial endowment aims at maintaining the propriety and anchoring conservation into this one required ecological state. The initial lump sum is calculated so that yearly interests cover the costs of maintenance. This requirement to maintaining land in a specific shape can look somehow surprising to an environmental scientist as it goes against natural laws. In addition, this mechanism also faces natural resistance, so to speak, as climate change currently jeopardizes this finance conservation balance. The rise of temperature renders the land unsuitable for species in many cases, and the endowment may not always be sufficient to maintain land in the desired ecological state under a changing climate. So this, to give you a sense of, of the complexity of the mechanisms to ensure the equivalence between a piece of land that will be targeted for economic activities and a secured piece of land that bears conservation. I insist on these elements as they reveal how conservation banks are tied to financial markets in two different ways. First, conservation bankers borrow on financial market to invest in land and expect a return on investment of 10% on average when selling the credits. At least when I investigated three years ago in the USA, that was the rate they were expecting. And second, endowments are invested on financial markets to secure ecological risk in the long run, as I just explained. So endowments are an important part of the upfront production costs together with the price of land, which means that they are inversely proportional. A high endowment limits return on investments for the investors. So scrutinizing the technical details of these land protection mechanisms highlight two major tensions. The first one is related to the temporalities of ecology and finance. The second one is related to the special scales of action. First, this conservation banking mechanism is built on a tension between long-term ecological rationality and the idea that a good conservation is conservation in the long run and a short-term financial vision that favors rapid returns on investments. Here we are with the future of the rent. This tension deeply questions the possibility to entrust land conservation policies to financial markets. Where does the balance lie between making the land pay and attracting investors and making the land be an ecologically sound area? That's a big research question to my, in my sense, and, but also a big policy issue. And the second tension I wanted to mention is related to the scale of conservation. Because conservation biologists agree on the fact that for many species, recovery requires landscape approaches. Landscape is the scale that allows for good conservation of the species as it enables management of the whole ecosystem and species population, and not only a, a reduced number of individuals. Consequently, landscape scale is also promoted under the ESA as the relevant scale for conservation planning and actions. Yet, Landscape frequently entails multiple ownerships, and as we saw, conservation banking is this key mechanism for conservation, even though a robust mechanism is developed at the plot scale. In sum, protection of a piece of land to play a part in landscape conservation requires, once again, to align ecological interests and economic interests, identifying spots where located conservation can provide landscape benefits, and also where landowners are willing to engage in conservation banking. In the second part of my talk, I will outline a specific case study that I conducted in Oklahoma with Ritwick Bush from Arizona State University three years ago. We chose Oklahoma as we had realized that California and Florida concentrated most of the scholarly attention and we were eager to conduct research in other parts of the country. 
Oklahoma appeared as an appealing case as it's not, it's not known for the presence of an active environmental movement that would favor the implementation environment of environmental policies. But yet, two conservation banks had been approved in the early 2010s to ensure protection of a beetle, this little beetle that you can see here on the picture, called the American Burying Beetle, or ABB. The case of ABB is worth detailing because it helps going further in addressing the temporal and spatial tensions I mentioned before. So the ABB lives in open area and pasture land, and its population that used to be uh, dis distributed across 35 US states has reduced and disappeared from 80% uh, of its historical distribution range. As you can see on the map, there's now three remaining population, one in Rhode Island, one in Oklahoma, one in Nebraska, basically. And Oklahoma is the largest natural ABB habitat in the USA. ABB habitat there in Oklahoma also sits atop of one of the largest, largest oil reserves in the country. We'll see that uh, opens the way to uh, market-based conservation. But uh, first, I need to add a detail about the ecology of the ABB. The ABB lives underground. That's the funny part of the story. During our investigation in Oklahoma, we met many ABB experts, scientists, consultants that dedicated their career to studying and counting ABBs, but they had never seen an ABB in the wild, outside of the buckets used to trap and study them. So that's an important detail to grasp the fact that knowledge about this little insect, about its living condition, its presence or absence on a piece of land, is doomed with uncertainty. Researching, research is ongoing and ABB experts keep on advancing new knowledge about ecology and new propositions for its protection. The beetle has been formally listed as endangered under the ESA in 1989, but the permitting process for oil and gas companies willing to develop oil wells in the Oklahoma remained pretty smooth until 2012. Prior to 2012, the US Fish and Wildlife Service considered that translocation of the species was a sufficient prerequisite not to harm the species and to authorize drilling and pipeline installations. In other words, at that time, the agency asked oil and gas companies and their environmental consultants to trap beetles with rotten chickens and to relocate them on other plots of land suitable for ABBs and where no development projects were planned. That was called fade away or trap or relocate. In 2012, a bunch of scientists from the State University of Nebraska published a paper where they demonstrated that trap and relocate was doing no good to the beetle, as during trapping, they were likely to get eaten by predators and relocation was also affecting the soundness of the individuals. So the Fish and Wildlife Service came under intense pressure to stop allowing the baiting and trapping based mitigation. Some field level officers brandished the scientific evidence as an incentive to rethink mitigation measures for oil and gas development and promoted the idea of setting land apart and organizing conservation banking mechanisms. This change in regulation created investment possibilities for conservation bankers and two ABB conservation banks were approved in 2013. Here you can see a picture of one conservation banker showing us around uh, an ABB bank in Oklahoma. This allowed for an easy make, make mitigation solution for oil and gas companies. A mere check of $20,000 per acre was sufficient to fulfill regulatory obligations and to get development oil and gas project authorized. Here again, the case of the ABB reveals temporal and spatial tensions. We observed that the rise of a costly option had a direct influence on the structure of land development, as it influences the type of oil and gas projects that can be developed. Within the landscape of oil and gas projects, not all companies could afford paying $12,000 per acre, especially the activities of small firms building individual oil wells were stopped. This was the case in the Osage County that we talked about before, where individual entrepreneurs were unable to carry out further activities. In such, the rise of a robust mitigation option participated in some kind of concentration of the local economy, 
and in artificialization pattern based on big plots of developed land, more than small and distributed uh, small plots among landscapes. Second, to understand how the ABB case speaks of the temporal tension between conservation and finance, I first need to tell the end of the story. In 2015, as oil prices dropped, the Independent Petroleum Association of America petitioned the Fish and Wildlife Service to delist the ABB on the grounds that ABB did not meet listing criteria anymore. In 2020, the US Fish and Wildlife Service concluded that the ABB was not currently endangered anymore and removed the mitigation obligation for development project permitting. No need to buy credits anymore. At least not until a counter lit litigation may lead to a relisting of the, the species. So the story of conservation banking in Oklahoma proved to be short-lived, but in the end of the day, something remains. ABB conditions is likely to decrease as construction now goes unregulated. Financiers saw their assets suddenly losing all value. What remains and should remain in perpetuity are the two 30,000 acres plot of land now protected under a conservation easement. Such story tells us about the fragility of valuation mechanism. Accessing land, organizing conservation, building up securement and insurance takes tremendous time, administrative work and expert inputs. Meeting up the conditions to ensure that both finance and conservation interests will be met on a dedicated piece of land is rare, as it entails to fulfill so many prerequisites. But yet, even when all has fallen apart, conservation has been weakened, finance turned away, but some land remains. In the last slide, I will um, briefly provide further details about the prerequisites I mentioned for conservation banking adoption with a few quotes that I got during interviews. So just to let you know, uh, another part of the investigation I carried out about conservation banking consisted in understanding what are the factors that underlie uh, investing decisions from conservation bankers. Based on what do they decide to invest in one state more another, in one species more another, etc. Um, first, um, conservation bankers carry out market studies, as one can imagine, and they seek to understand where is land development ongoing, where it's overlapping endangered species habitat, where are industries going to develop new projects? And some industries such as housing are known for their high profit, profits, which entails the possibility to sell credits at a high price. So here you have this quote, if there's a strong need for a project that made a lot of money, you can, I, I, can't, I can't read the whole thing. You can sell credits, very no poor credits in California, you know, anywhere from 150 to three or 400,000 an acre for urban development houses. Houses make big money. But there are also territorial and biological factors that come into play in the calculation of expected returns on investments. For instance, the size of the species population has a direct impact on the ratio between impacts and credits available, whereas the pace of restoration of species habitat also influences the length of time between upfront investments and credit availability, which has a direct impact on the return rate. In conclusion, I thought I'd show you that uh, there's also a mitigation bank, so a bank that's made out to uh, protect wetlands here, uh, not so far from where you are in Staten Island. Um, and um, I think it's also an interesting way to show that these banks are also right in the middle of this urban, uh, densely uh, constructed environment. And, but there are still, there are a way to achieve some kind of distribution of the value um, between the built environment and the unbuilt environment. And maybe just as a rapid conclusion, uh, if you're interested in buying one of these credits, they're worth uh, something like around $1 million per acre, but you can afford to buy just half of one if you're interested. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you with that final pitch for us to get invested in our conservation bank. Um, thank you so much, Stephanie. Um, and uh, the format calls for me to let the two of you be in conversation. Uh, I will uh, occupy some uh, airspace for a moment uh, with throwing some questions, um, or, let's say thematics. And I, I also refrain from 
uh, indulging my temptation to ask Timothy to give us right now the revisionist take on Cass Gilbert that we all really want to know, and to ask Stephanie more about this uh, land bank, which is right there in um, Staten Island. So it seems to me that there are kind of, I, want, I would say three themes that we could speak across the papers and across your, your inquiries. One is space, the other time, and the third is paper. Paper in the sense of a piece of paper that transforms um, how the economy works. In terms of space, it's really, it seems a big transformation is being made in the question of what proximity is. Um, uh, Timothy, your, your, your critique of the urbanization of capital thesis is one that puts pressure on everything we think we know about the alliance of capital and density, of centrality, of proximity, the idea of the metropolis as a place that concentrates people in space as well as attracting capital. So I'm curious what happens to proximity. And Stephanie also, in, clearly the, the mechanisms ask for similar nature to be restored nearby. And the nearby is a completely unfactored uh, in the market itself. And so I wonder how these mechanisms transform our idea of proximity. So that's space. The time element, it seems to me you're both talking about, I mean, Tim, Tim you had this sort of critique of a backwards and forwards mentality, but, but there's a kind of middle range, let's say, of temporality, which durability would occupy. So it's not a forever and it's not an immediate. On the contrary, it seems like the questions of maintenance would be at the heart of it. And Stephanie, you also mentioned that there's problems of having to fix fences and having to maintain things. So, in a way, the question would be sort of like, what about the scale of maintenance, the temporal scale of maintenance? Has, had been, has this been financialized or is it actually just not a, a relevant scale? And I ask this in part because I suspect that an architectural audience would think somehow they're occupying this middle scale. And then finally, paper, because you know it's the most visible aspect of these mechanisms, but of course, invisibly behind there is sometimes architecture, there are beetles who are more or less invisible. Um, and, and the wild, you know, is not visible. You're showing us the wild is not visible. You're both talking about a natural experiment in which a piece of paper somehow made a big um, impact. So I, the question I have is kind of dumb and big, but to what extent do cultural visibilities um, affect these natural experiments? You know, and, and the case that comes to my mind is one drawn from Tim, Tim's older work on, on Egypt, where you have people like the architect Hassan Fati, who is there to facilitate, in that case, the natural experiment there. And, and Hassan Fati is an architect, yes, but he also speaks a kind of economic language. He talks about price, etc. And I imagine, Stephanie, that you also, in the markets you study, there are these kind of middle facilitators, agents who make visible, make things more visible than not. So I, I don't know if this is, in other words, they, they're not as formal as a piece of paper, but they facilitate somehow. So these are the kind of three larger themes, but I let you maybe, um, you know, uh, Tim, if you want to sort of start us off with questions, answers, or any comments, really. I'd love to. Should I take all three, or would it be better if I take one and- uh, Maybe and one, and then we sort Stephanie of- Stephanie comes back yeah. on, the, uh, because, um, uh, otherwise, I'll, I'll go on for too long. Um, so, um, so I'll take them in, in the order. Um, uh, proximity and um, specifically capital and density. Oh, um, I, I mean, I was struck by this, this the, 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 the way that worked in Stephanie's paper, and I'm struggling to think how to make it work in mine. I mean, there was an obvious way in that case study I looked at because part of the way in which I uh, showed the unreliable nature of the research um, that appeared to establish um, the validity of De Soto's claims in uh, six cities in Peru was that it had claimed essentially that one, one informal neighborhood is just like another. Um, whereas one of the things that actually came out when you read more closely how the research had come out, on the contrary, proximity had defined the way in which different neighborhoods were titled at different moments because um, they wanted the pilot to be a success and informal neighborhoods that were long established tended to be in the city center so people had access to jobs and so they looked like they were 
precisely um, doing all the things that people with access to capital were meant to be doing. Um, it, it could be by, by assuming every neighborhood is like every other, you could um, as you could attribute this to the to the to the consequences of the program rather than uh, actually understanding a little bit more about how something like proximity to an urban center um, affects the way people inhabit um, uh, the informal and how if if you're lucky enough to have your informal housing close to a city center, it essentially it, it, it becomes a fairly uh, desirable location for all kinds of reasons while you're still uh, somewhat protected from the financial mechanisms of the uh, of, of the kinds of investment people want to put in place. So um, let me say that I, I actually just want to think a minute about the way you, in terms of capital and density. But I, I feel the the space issue is so relevant to Stephanie's uh, paper that I, I may come back on that item. But let me I, I'd be interested to hear what Stephanie has to say. Well, thank you, uh, thank you very much. Um, about the question of space and proximity, I think it's also a nice way to kind of articulate in, in, in the case of conservation policies, the way you have these entanglements and, and but also uh, tensions between regulations and finance. And the, the, the whole story, right, is about how there's some kind of law act that is a, a stating a framework a way to preserve but then that it's being implemented through financial mechanism and that also speaks to the question of proximity actually um, the uh, species conservation and biodiversity conservation unlike other types of uh, environmental um, uh, policies like carbon carbon you know is a very standardized uh, thing any any type of uh, greenhouse gas you can make it a reduce it to a unit a ton of carbon whereas this is something you can't do with biodiversity you know the, there's still a, a level of coherence coherence of the population which means that you will never be able to in my case destroy the habitat of a snake in California and come and mitigate it by buying, uh, uh, I don't know, an ostrich credit uh, in another state of the country. So you have the, the law kind of sets and imposes this very strong ecological coherence and this convention that, you know, a species is a species and you can't exchange it with something else. And you have to think and the, the proximity and the the size of the markets is very reduced. These markets, you know, they're they are based on the on the population areas so the law kind of imposes some level of proximity but then finance as we see is also um, uh, uh, playing with the value of land because the value of land is, is, is a, a big part in the return on investments that investors are seeking when they invest in these conservation policies and um, so even though you have this proximity and, and for instance in urban settings there are also a way to maintain natural areas in, in areas that are getting densified and densified with constructions but still they impose to have natural areas um, and around um, but when you look at the value of the land usually the, the, the where it's interesting to build is maybe within the very built environment and the and the, the the conservation banks will tend to be maybe further in the peri-urban areas. So it, even though the, this mechanism of proximity is, is being this one definition by the regulatory framework, and then the finance will kind of play it out a little bit different in, in a different way in that sense. I'm struck by the way in which, therefore, the urban development that follows is, in, is entirely um, uncontrolled or, or no, nothing is controlled for it does not have a value except maybe in the phenomenon that actually Tim was mentioning that housing is a much more quantifiable form of space than let's say you know an ecological unit of an ecological family of, of beetles uh, so in, in that sense the 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 the, the, the transformation of housing and urban development into highly quantifiable, tradable, uh, developable uh, quantity facilitates um, the capacity for conservation banks to even exist. So mm -hmm. behind every conservation banks and every discourse of uh, diversity and biodiversity, there is the sameness of the built environment somewhere of the that humans live in. Um, yeah. Do you want to? Uh, yeah, just let me 
come back one quick thing and then I'll go on to your second question. Um, uh, and this has been partly uh, inspired by Stephanie's remarks. Um, ah, sorry. Um, but I've forgotten it. I was already thinking about your next question. I'll come back. Let, let, let me sorry, talk about I did the second question. <laughs> um, no, there, there was um, something really uh, interesting that uh, came out of that, but I cannot. Oh, sorry. I just wanted to think about this point um, that, that uh, Stephanie made in relation to carbon being measurable and um, endangered species being much more difficult, which, which I think is fascinating. Um, there is some interesting, obviously, ways of thinking about you know, what kinds of translations have to be done to make every um, form of consumption of carbon uh, into something that produces a single. So it appears to be measurable in a simple way. And, and I think that's a very powerful difference to make. Um, but then whether um, whether urban land or urban property um, is equally readable, I wonder. And I think that's part of the way the research in Peru sort of found it because, um, and certainly I first came to it from research in Egypt because friends of mine were asked to actually do the work of trying to um, figure out the difference between the value of informal housing and formal housing for the whole city so that DeSoto could make a claim that if the Egyptians adopted his plans, they would realize so many billion dollars worth of untapped wealth simply by the difference in value between what is informal and what is formal. They could not figure this out. I mean, there's no way. And actually, um, while I was just doing a little research on the history of New York and current building practices for today's purposes. I, I tried to find out the difference between um, uh, construction costs and um, uh, un the cost of unimproved land in New York, in Manhattan. It seems impossible to figure out, um, partly because there's almost no unimproved land that comes on the market, a, a variety of reasons, um, uh, and partly because actual construction costs vary so much uh, from neighborhood, et cetera, et cetera. So, I, I, I think, to me, what's interesting about you know the work Stephanie's doing is precisely opening up the enormous amount of work that has to be done to produce something called value um, or price. Uh, so, as against um, a, a sort of mainstream economist sense that that is going to be produced by the intersection of a, a supply and demand somewhere. No, that's a, a little device that may or may not work at certain points. As uh, you know, Stephanie has shown the incredible amount of work of of engineering that has to be done to produce the price of something is is fascinating. Um, uh, did, Stephanie, do you want to go first on the second one? I, I don't want to keep necessarily going first on the question of time and maintenance and mm -hmm. durability and. Yeah. Um, yeah. Sure. Um, about time, I think the the. the um, what I like in the in these conservation policies, especially in the USA, because they're they're framed in a very different way in France, actually. But in the USA, as I said, you have this legal tool that I was quite fascinated about when I first learned about it, because we don't have such a tool in 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 France, at least not in that way, which is the the conservation easement, because it's meant to protect land in perpetuity. And so, what what is perpetuity? You know, so. Perpetuity, when, when, when we ask legal scholars in the USA, usually they say, oh yeah, perpetuity is about 150 years. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> okay. And then, and then you know, I started digging in, in these mechanisms and I saw that to, to be able to implement perpetuity, you need to tie the mechanisms to financial markets. As I, as I explained, so, so it means investing endowments and with the financial interest, being able to maintain the banks in perpetuity with the yearly interest every year uh, having this maintenance. So the underlying also assumption is that the financial markets will be here in perpetuity, which is also a nice assumption, I think, to, to, <laughs> to make. So like conservation is being tied to financial markets and these financial markets are being um, are thought to be working uh, in perpetuity 
perpetuity. So I think this this is a great idea. And, and, and as I said, that, that you know, changing climate is completely jeopardizing this kind of strange balance that is being composed between conservation, uh, legal tools, financial investments, species, bureaucrats, investors, and uh, and so on. So, so the, this this question of time is is really key. Is it is key to it? And uh, the you know the, the temporality of nature is really not the temporality of finance. So how do we make the interplay between all these? Is I, I think it is a fascinating. If any, is it your sense that the American why would uh, why would why would the American market have a notion of perpetuity, but the French one not? What would that be? I mean, the, the legal the legal tools, we don't have such uh, legal tools that uh, would uh, protect and secure land in perpetuity. We don't have that category in the, in, the, in the legal, in the French uh, environment. The legal. Uh, yeah, it's the legal tool. that concept of have. perpetuity in French law yeah. does not have to land or to anything. Yeah, it because... Conservationism is tied to the land, which means that uh, even though you, you, I mean, you sell the land, whatever you do with the land, the, the, the conservation conservation easement and the obligations with the conservation easement remain. So it's really tied to the land. It's not tied to the owner. Yes. Whereas in France, we we have you know long term uh, easements for like ninety nine years, but uh, they're they're tied to the owner. Actually, we just recently in 2016, we got a, a similar type of tool, but it's it's not really being implemented at the moment. Great. Tim, did you want to? Yeah, that's interesting. Um, that question of perpetuity in particular, and I, I don't know enough legal history to know why the uh, Anglosphere systems are different from the French, but you know, there is this way, of course, in which one of the things modern states want to do is they want to prevent things being done in perpetuity because there's a long history of institutions like the church and many others that endow and, and prevent the, 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 the state from taxing um, uh, and so on. And that, that whole history of, of what can be done in perpetuity and what perpetuity means, I, I think would be a very interesting thing for somebody who actually knows the history to, to weigh in on. But um, uh, yes. Um, so the sort of this this notion of, of what is perpetuity and as against sort of middle range and how that relates to my argument about um, durability, um, you know. So I, I introduced the term durability because I think this moment um, in the late nineteenth century um, is an important moment in the history of durability um, because it becomes possible to build these apparatuses of capture of future revenue. Um, on a new scale, um, it's not. That, that's always been what people have tended to do, but it's tend to happen through land owning and agriculture, and then uh, increasingly from the 16th, 17th century, um, much more extensive control of long distance trade, which you know gave you a durability of a sort of two year trade cycle or whatever, as opposed to the sort of one year durability of, of the agricultural cycle. But suddenly, in the late 19th century, or not so suddenly, you can see, but one one can see this sort of concentration of new forms of durability that have to do partly with the emergence of new kinds of materials um, or materials that can be used in, in new ways. Um, manufacturing processes make steel affordable so that um, it can be used for rail lines um, when building railways so that um, uh, rail, talking of maintenance, they only need to be replaced every 30 years, whereas before when they were made of iron and they buckled easily, they had to be replaced every 12 months. Um, so durability has a history, and that's the point I'm trying to make, um, because, of course, we, we think of uh, modernity and particularly the sort of acceleration of modernity since the late 19th century in terms of speed up, in terms of things that happen more rapidly. And one of the things I'm trying to do is, against that, look at a history of how things are kind of spread out, and precisely because that's spreading out um, in something as close to perpetuity as you can get, um, becomes or reemerges as this extraordinary source of wealth. So as opposed to that brief interlude where you were kind of stuck making your money out of machines, out of factories, which is why I think that Gilbert's metaphor is a little dated, um, uh, uh, that, um, that you don't have to bother with that detour through manufacturing very much anymore because you now you can build these structures that don't have to have more and more rapid turnover, but 
on the contrary, work from the durability or the extension in time in ways I was referring to. But you're quite right, and as Stephanie says, you know, durability or perpetuity, or perpetuity means what, 99 years or something. And mm -hmm. one of the things that's so important, I think, for architecture is that whereas other kinds of emergence of, sort of stock markets and other ways of uh, uh, acquiring from and speculating on the future are dealing with sort of five, 10, 15 year horizons. Architecture is dealing with 20, 40, 50 years. I mean, that's how that's the period of time over which you can capitalize um, uh, the, the, um, the value of something you've built. So it's vastly different. And of course, that's still the case today, which is why you know, 50% of all money is created um, in the housing sector. It is the thing that will create long-term credit, far more so than um, than uh, than any kind of uh, sort of business um, venture. You can make a lot of money, um, I don't know, creating a monopoly on car services and calling it Uber, but, um, but that's only being calculated over uh, five or 10 years, um, whereas, a building is much more durable. So it's relative, but it, there is a, the point is there's a history to different kinds of durability. And I think that's exactly what um, Stephanie's um, thing with this, how do you produce something that, and you know, the connection in her paper with the fact that you are producing something notionally in perpetuity um, that is fixing an environment which precisely is meant to be that which is constantly in flux. And I think that's absolutely fascinating to, to think about. It was uh, built into the, the, just to pitch my own research, the, it was built into the notion of reinforced concrete, that it would be something that would last in perpetuity, but that would have to be patented every year because the in innovation rate was so fast. Um, and, and so this idea of slowing down the capture of wealth or, that, or expanding um, the capture of wealth, um, how does that, um, deal with, you know, how, how does that help us revise our notion of, of precisely kind of innovative uh, notion of technology and therefore, let's say, of architectural technologies being driven in some way by a kind of clip of innovation? And, and kind of a similar question to you, Stephanie, because I was struck that you're, you specifically did not choose to go to California and Florida, who places which would have a claim to novelty, et cetera, whereas you went to Oklahoma, where presumably nobody's that proud of this happening or claiming it for a kind of novelty. So what does this do to our notion of a kind of uh, entrepreneurship or, or novelty driving markets? Um, which of us is gonna go first, sorry. Go first, go first, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so um, sort of um, technology is innovations. You immediately bring to mind the work of um, the historian of technology, um, David Edgerton. Who, um, whose argument in his book, the, the Shock of the Old, is we've got to stop thinking about te technology or the technical, right, under this sign of innovation. Um, partly because a lot of stuff that claims to be new isn't new, partly because it coexists and only operates thanks to um, uh, the existence of very old things. You, yes, you can use a, a high-speed drill, but you, in your other things, you've got a hammer. Um, and um, uh, uh, partly because it, um, you know, it, it, it gives this sort of power to some process of innovation, which may not be the way to think about the technical and the technological. Um, and that's certainly, you know, that's, that's been a book that's been really helpful to me um, for, for thinking about ways that we should think about the, fact, the technical. And you know, one of the things it brings in is this concern for, for maintenance, which you know, doesn't come under the category of innovation, right? Um, uh, it comes precisely under the capital, uh, under the idea of, of, of making do and fixing and mending and so on, which somehow um, aren't thought to be part of technology. Um, but of course, um, as we've been talking about, are absolutely central to it, um, and um, uh, and because uh, because of my interest in in durability in, in in the history of the construction of ways of stretching out time, uh, so much of what is thought of under this rubric of things happening more rapidly of 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 innovation um, occurring, is obscuring the fact that so many of these things are in fact designed to make things. Uh, less efficient, more extended, 
uh, because what drives them is the ways in which you can control revenue payments, rents of whatever sort over longer and longer periods of time. And that, that doesn't mean that you need always to be the most innovative or the up to date. No, technically what you need to be is um, the device or the apparatus or the technology that will most secure these largely monopolistic or at least um, uh, relatively secure forms of, of control of revenue schemes. So you know, the entire way that technology sort of governs our, our thinking of time and the future is, is, is problematic. And again, I think... Um, I mean, I want to hear uh, <laughs> Stefani's answer, but I'm struck by the fact that the, if the property title policy can be thought of as a kind of technology, property titling in Peru precedes mm -hmm. Uh, De Soto, like there are, there are older programs where there were attempts to to do the, to to remedy the so-called informal um, problem with titling. So what does what aside from is it is it the sort of fame of De Soto? Is it the internationalism? Is it the climate? What does it what is it that that time um, it quote unquote works or it is sort of taken up as a policy? That's an interesting question. Um, I think what he offers is a vast kind of simplification um, because yes, um, property titling has been around and even serious attempts to deal with property titling and the problems of property titling as part of development projects and so on. But he comes along with this vast project of simplification and it's actually something he's been trained in. So the think tanks who take him up in the neoliberal movement um, uh, interested in the kind of political takeover, right, of, of the discourse, the economic and the political discourse of, of the West. And one of the things they've sort of worked on is sloganeering and simplification and, um, and marketing. And, you know, these think tanks that he comes and, you know, he, they love him because, as they say explicitly, you know, he's from the third world. So he can say things that we can't say about the backwardness of the third world. Um, and they make a big deal of this. But what they're training him in and he himself comes already equipped with is marketing, sloganeering, simplification of the message. So I think, um, you know, the notion of paper is itself, you know, or he says all these people need is a piece of paper. And with this piece of paper, they're now secure to go out and get jobs because they can sit at home and that piece of paper is there to show them. I think you're muted. And that's wonderful. The, the piece of paper taking the place of the person who goes out to, in the work. <laughs> uh, Stephanie, go ahead. I cut you, you were. Sure, sure. Yeah, maybe I think this, uh, there's uh, an interesting point about this idea of simplification because the the whole story I'm saying is is that of complexification, actually, and not of simplification. So it's it's I think it's an interesting point, and and maybe ma making a link with the, this notion of paper and paperwork and administrative work that is also being involved in the in the making of all these conservation policies, um, and maybe that's a, a, a also a link between this idea of why Oklahoma and not California, but. Um, Actually, yes, indeed, as I showed, all this is, is really a matter of, you know, investing time, bureaucratic time in, you know, writing all these conservation plans because you need consistent conservation plans. Otherwise, investors will never come because they will not be sure to get a return on their investment. So that this... This very, this very, this vast and tremendous amount of work that is being brought into the system that also explains why it's very, very, very slowly expanding within the whole country. I mean, as I showed on the map, you, there's only 18 states that have adopted uh, such a conservation policy because this it needs to, you know, to have these very thick books of conservation habitat plans and things that help its work. So that's one of one of the idea complexification of the system. It makes construction more complicated, so litigation and, and so on. And and maybe a, a naive uh, remark about all that, but um, uh, everything emerged in, in California actually. So the first conservation banks to were uh, constructed in California, and after ten years, the federal state state took on uh, took on uh, the, the the mechanisms and decided to implement it in the rest of the country. And when we arrived, and so we had that story in mind when we arrived in Oklahoma, and we, we were sure that everybody would refer to California as the place, you know, where everything started and everything happened. And 
And uh, when and everybody was actually quite surprised to see a French scholar. And my colleague Ritwik is a, is an Indian, is from India. So these two diff, two scholars like coming in, in Oklahoma, you know, and asking about beetles. That was you know kind of strange. <laughs> and uh, and um, and we had the whole story in mind. So we we were sure that everybody would refer to California, and nobody knew really about California. Things were happening here in Oklahoma. The mo the closest state uh, with the more historical experience was Texas. So we had you know people coming from Texas to invent, invest in Oklahoma. And I was quite surprised. I mean, maybe that's naive from a European you know vision, but I was kind kind of surprised to see that yeah, this divide you know between California that was where everything kind of happens in Oklahoma where no, I mean, things are here happening here, happening in Texas. And, and yeah. I mean, it, it's been a, um, it's been a, just because we have maybe, well, we're over time, but uh, it's been a challenge to think of getting, how to speak about land in the US, although we are calling it land in the Americas because there's different Americas in the US and also the US belongs in a kind of spectrum of American continent uh, to how to speak about land without uh, further objectifying it in a way that these markets really have a unique way of doing it. And um, I think that the, the the interstate relationships, just a small point to what you just said, is turning out to be completely fruitful. There truly is a different way to tell the history of the relation of state and market in the United States than, than certainly France, but also than Peru, than this. Um, so um, I'd I don't think we have any sort of present uh, questions in the chat. Now, uh, so I wanted to say if you had last comments for us, since we, you know, we're on a schedule of people returning to their classes, having given them this kind of interlude of absolutely wonderful um, interventions from you too. So I, I wanted to give you one last chance to say last thoughts. Go ahead, Tim. Uh Okay, um, well, I, my last thoughts are actually about Stephanie's paper, which is just to, to say one line, when you introduced the conversation, conservation bank, you said, you know, don't think about a bank, you know, a high street bank. And I actually want people to go away from your paper and um, now, uh, and, and not think that, but instead every time they see a high street bank, uh, think about a field in Oklahoma, because I think, <laughs> you know, because you're, because you're capturing something as it's being invented, you're seeing how it works. And of course, a high street bank works the same way um, in terms of uh, coming up with a set of mechanisms for, for credit creation that rest entirely on forms of um, uh, you know, law and regulation that are give it this power of the extending of credit for some purpose. Now, this purpose is a particularly fascinating one, but don't mislead people into thinking that ordinary banks work any differently. Um, <laughs> so and with that in mind, you know, I, I, I think there's between what you're doing and some of the stuff I've been talking about, particularly sort of trying to think about uh, urban housing and speculation and, and the grounds for speculation, there's another connection between our papers, which is that, um, of course, um, uh, one of the ways in which this opening up of the possibility of ever more credit on the basis of housing um, uh, takes on a new life is 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 with the um, is is with the vast expansion of credit in the U.S. and other countries around the creation of second mortgages and the repackaging and slicing up of mortgages to create the vast um, uh, debt uh, bubble of of the early 2000s, which ends in the crash of 2008. Now, what do they do? They can't. All, all those people who've been creating finance through um, a speculation in, in, in housing, where do they go? They go to Oklahoma um, because they need a new field of speculation. And the one that's been written about is the money pours into fracking um, in places like Oklahoma. But of course, there's some other savvy people who realize, hey, this fracking is involving some beetles. We could create another field of speculation by, so it all fits together. And I really enjoyed the conversation with you. Fantastic. Thank you. If any, do you want to? Yeah, yeah maybe just a, a very, very quick word. Um, yeah, I think also what speaks to our stories is the how uh, people or species, uh, you know, uh, get integrated into the policies of the, the economic world or uh, conservation world. And um, uh, the case of the, the case of uh, in the USA reminds me of um, 
um, a French sociologist was talking about individu par excès, individu par défaut. So it's like negative individuals and positive individuals because some of them, they have the characteristics to answer to the requirements of the policies. For instance, the, 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 the loan policy uh, with the formalization of property rights or the positive characteristics of species being able to, you know, speak up to finance and, and conservation policies. So here we also have this kind of positive individuals versus negative yeah. individuals being integrated or not in the, in the mechanisms. Well, with this, uh, encouraging everyone who is watching and listening that to next time they pass a bank, imagine a field of needles, <laughs> invisible, except if, if they have been collected by a little uh, Tupperware. Um, I want to really <laughs> thank deeply um, Tim and Tiffany for joining us, for playing along, and everyone for joining us. And we will have one more event for this semester, which will be a book launch for the new aggregate volume, Writing Architectural History. And you should check our website for that. It's April 22nd. Thank you again both very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.